for today. Because I pretty much have to do the same thing for you guys, or with you guys, that I did with my first class. Um, even though I said I would try not to spend too much time on it, uh, pretty much all of today will be discussion of this bit of background of Tolkien and then the fairy story essay, which let me reiterate, you're not required to read. Okay, I've got it linked um, as a PDF under the content tab on D2L, but you're not required to read it. You will not be tested over it. With this exception, there may be stuff from it as extra credit. That's it. Okay, but no, no required stuff will come from um, the fairy story essay. But I think I said this in here. If we got even this far. Um, if you want to understand Tolkien, that is, if you really want to understand him, you've got to read his fairy story. It, it, it's the key, you know, I tell my usual students, it's the key to understanding anything Tolkien has written, even stuff like his nonfiction, like his literary criticism, like this essay about Babel. It gives us insight into how he reads and appreciates and looks at um, looks at literature. So I know I talked about some of this the other day, but I don't think I, I didn't get to all of it. Um, so let me try to cover that relatively quickly. <clears throat> Tolkien, I, I mentioned the other day, was a professor of Anglo-Saxon at Oxford University. He served in World War I. We're going to talk a little bit about that once we actually get into um, Lord of the Rings. Served in World War I, came back, finished university, um, was appointed at Oxford in the 20s, and in the summer, I believe it was, of 1931, he was marking an entrance exam to Oxford University. Did I talk about this the other day? Yeah. I did. Okay. Where he writes in a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. He had no idea what a hobbit was, so he had to start figuring out. So he starts telling the story to his children and starts writing it in reading the parts that he's written to his friends. Okay, They're reading the stuff they've been writing to him and such. And so he sends it off to a publisher. I think I mentioned this. I'll mention it again. A guy by the name of Stanley Unwin, 1936 or so. Unwin gets it, and he, read, he just looks at the title page. The Hobbit, or there and back again. He has no idea what a Hobbit is. Nobody does. So he gives it to his son, who's 10 years old. His son, Raynor, or Rainer, R-A-Y-N-E-R, reads it and writes a little report for his father. He says, this is a great story. You ought to publish it. So he does. Very small print run. I think it is 500 at first. It sells out. Prints more, sells out. Prints more, sells out. Upshot is, in 1937, when The Hobbit is published, <clears throat> Tolkien is internationally famous okay, as a writer of a modern classic of children's literature or a modern fairy tale. Okay? It, it, it's kind of a misnomer. You cannot be an immediate classic. The, the term classic in literary criticism kind of implies it has stood the test of time. The test of time means it's been around a long time. Like, you know, Homer's Iliad and Odyssey are classics. Why? People have been reading them for over 2,500 years. Sophocles' plays are classics. They are still being read. Shakespeare's a classic and stuff. I don't know that J.K. Rowling will still be read 200 or 500 years from now. I think Tolkien will. All right? I could be wrong. I kind of think she will be. Because even though, even though she's not a great writer, she's a great storyteller. There's a huge difference between a storyteller and a writer. Tolkien's a great writer. He doesn't leave any loose ends. J.K. Rowling's got enough loose ends to, you know, make a quilt out of. Um, there's, there's one of the things I'll do, and I, if you're a real Rowling fan, sorry, uh, I'm going to, you know, point out an awful lot of the problems, or the flaws, even errors in her writing. Errors within the writing itself that a good copy editor would have been and should have caught. 
Most of them show up, however, after the first three books. Most of those errors do. In other words, beginning with books four and forward. Well, by that point, she's making so much money for Bloomsbury, the publisher, that I think they're kind of treating every word she says is like the goose that laid the golden egg. I mean, they're just not going to touch it. That's why Order of the Phoenix is so long. It's like every word, dollars, man. It needed a good editor. It could easily be 200 pages shorter. Easily. If I'd been editing, it would have. I used to edit a Star Wars journal. Okay? So, internationally recognized. You know, wonderful storyteller, blah, 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 blah. He's supposed to be writing scholarly stuff, by the way. When he's given that endowed chair at Oxford, he's supposed to be doing scholarly research. Some of his colleagues, they're not real happy with him because he's not churning out the scholarly stuff. He is still doing it, okay? But he's not churning it out like he ought to. So, on the basis of The Hobbit, Tolkien is invited to deliver a lecture at St. Andrews University in 1939. This is March of 1939. He's not their first choice. He's like third or fourth. Okay? The lecture is called the Andrew Lang Lecture. Andrew Lang was a 19th century literary guy who collected fairy stories and published them in a series of um, what are often sometimes called the rainbow colored books. Nothing to do with LGBT stuff. One book's red, one book's green, one book's blue, one book's orange. One, each book has a different color cover, okay? And each one has a different set kinds of fairy stories. So he's asked to deliver the Andrew Lang lecture, which is, you know, got to have something. It's got to have something to do with fairy stories. So he does. That then gets published in 1947. Or, let me rephrase that. Tolkien revises that for publication in 1947. Okay. Uh, for a couple of years, I was working on an edition of the fairy story essay. I'd gotten approval from the lawyer for Tolkien's literary estate to receive access to the manuscripts at the Bodleian Library in in Oxford, which means I could go to the Oxford reading room and I could submit a piece of paper that would say, bring me, and they would bring out Tolkien's manuscripts. Okay, So I got all the manuscripts for the fairy story essay, and I dutifully transcribed everything on all of those pages. Everything, well, everything that I could read. Tolkien wrote really small print, or really small handwriting, and he wrote in pencil from 1935, 36, 37, 38, 39, uh, excuse me, 1937, 38, pencil fades. And some of it is really faded and hard to read. But, and I, when I say copied everything, I mean everything. If he had a little doodle, I copied the doodle. If he had a line, I copied the line. I mean everything. Well, by the time I actually finished copying all that, the Tolkien estate had given approval to two other scholars to publish their edition of the fairy story essay. They didn't have everything done. See, my problem was I was an idiot because I did not, at first, write a proposal to submit to the estate. They did. They were both also previously published Tolkien scholars. One of them had done The Annotated Hobbit and late 80s, early 90s, something like that. And the other one had done a couple of books and a bunch of articles on Tolkien. I'd been spending most of my time on a 17th century author. So I had all this material. Tolkien has this material, which he then revises and publishes in 1947, OK? Um, from about 1938, until 1954, 53, I think it's safe to say, Tolkien works on what becomes known as the Lord of the Rings. Why? Because after he publishes The Hobbit, I have a trash can in here. And 
Um, he starts getting letters. Tell us more. We want to hear about more about hobbits. We want to hear more about Rivendell. We want to hear more about Elrond. We want to hear about the fall of Gondolin, which is alluded to. We want to hear more about Gandalf's backstory. Okay. He starts getting those letters in late 37, 38. People got to wait from then until then before they hear anything else. Okay. About hobbits, dwarves, elves, Middle Earth, etc., etc. And even then, they don't get the answers to what they're seeking. The fall of Gondolin is not referred to very much in, for example, The Lord of the Rings. Why? Because it's a story that predates the Hobbit. Remember the other day I talked about the, that old English passage, Ayala Arendelle, that line of verse that Tolkien then turns into a poem about a guy, a seafarer? Well, from that point on, he starts writing these stories about these people, peoples, I should say, in this world, Middle Earth, and it just it just balloons. Think of a snowball going down a hill. It just grows and grows and grows. Well, some of that just finds its way in the Hobbit. When he begins the Hobbit, and obviously he doesn't intend it to. Why? Because he doesn't know what a Hobbit is. So that stuff just kind of finds its way in. So from here to here, he focuses on Middle Earth after the Hobbit. Okay? After Bilbo Baggins takes his journey off to the Lonely Mountain and comes back. Or the subtitle of that novel, the title is The Hobbit, or there and back again. So Lord of the Rings kind of pick up, picks up after back again. In fact, it picked up 60 years later. Okay. The Hobbit begins with an unexpected party. The Fellowship of the Ring begins with a long expected party. That's how Tolkien links them. Okay. There's another big link, too. He has something happen in The Hobbit that he has no idea of its significance. Just utterly astounds me how authors' minds work, okay? He has Bilbo Baggins find the ring. He doesn't know what the ring is. He doesn't know its total significance. In fact, Tolkien issues a revised edition of The Hobbit where he changes a central chapter. Okay? And he does that because when he issues the revised edition, the light bulb has gone off and he's like, the ring, it's really important. So the ring becomes the real link between the Hobbit and the Fellowship of the Ring. Yeah, and you do have the character of Bilbo Baggins, and you have the character of Gandalf, and you have the character of Elrond and the elves, blah, 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 blah. By the way, just a little aside here. Elrond and the elves at Rivendell in The Hobbit, even though they are literally the same Elrond and the elves in The Lord of the Rings, they're totally different. Totally different. The elves in Rivendell in The Hobbit are flighty. I mean, they're silly. They're, they're like Veggie Tales silly songs, if you're familiar with Veggie Tales. The elves in The Lord of the Rings, ooh, they're deadly serious. Mm -hmm. I mean, somber. The world's going to end. And we've lived for thousands of years, and life sucks. And but they don't die. Because <laughs> they're immortal. They don't die. They can be killed, but they won't die on their own. They won't just drop dead. Okay? Like we do. Right? So, he publishes the first volume of The Lord of the Rings in July of 1954. Fellowship of the Rings. Right? The people have got to wait four more months before they get to the two towers. Well, if you've read The Lord of the Rings, keep, keep block out the films if you're you know film fan. If you've read The Lord of the Rings, the first volume is kind of a cliffhanger when it ends. Big cliffhanger. Now you got to wait four months to find out what happens. But you don't really. I mean, you kind of do. 
So the two towers get published in November. And then you gotta wait nearly a year. And this is a big cliffhanger at the end of two towers. Well, in Tolkien's mind, when he's writing it, see, because it's all done at this point. The whole thing's finished. Right? Tolkien, as I said the other day, he wants it published like this. One big, massive book. His publisher says, are you freaking crazy? That's a lot of money to print a 1,200-page novel. When I don't know that it's going to be a bestseller. I, I think it might because The Hobbit was good, but this is not The Hobbit. How many of you have read The Hobbit? Anybody? A couple of you, a few of you. How different is The Hobbit than this? And see, now I go like this. Words. Everybody else can't see this. It's, it's different. How? It's the Lord of the Rings is not, like you said, it's how the elves are very veggie tales and fun and exciting. The Hobbit is that, and Lord of the Rings is not that. The it's, Lord of the Rings is serious. It's in depth. This, this is adult yeah. literature. Doesn't mean adult no, triple X. Though, <laughs> no, I shouldn't go there. <laughs> you can find stuff online. National Lampoon, 1977, published a book called Board of the Rings, B O R E D, where they take some of the favorite figures of Lord of the Rings and they kind of I don't want to put this. Pornify them, okay? Eowyn, Galadriel, Aragorn, you know. Just let your mind go. You get an idea. I remember reading that for the first time. A friend of mine, I was in high school, a friend of mine had it, and I was like, because I was a huge Tolkien nerd at that point. I'd only read it, I think, maybe one, two times. Like, How dare he? But no, turn the page. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no pictures. So. His publisher said, we're not going to take that big of a bet. So you get the first volume, fifth volume, third volume. Internationally, again, masterpiece. A lot of critics had problems with it. A lot of readers had problems with it. Why? Where the hell is Middle Earth? Okay. I mean, come on. This is the mid-1950s. We just lived through World War II and World War I before that. It's the height of realism and naturalism in literature. Deal with the problems of the world in the world, you know. Catcher in the Rye. Fahrenheit 451 came out in 51. 1984 came out in 1948. Brave New World came out in 1931. I mean, the world sucks, man. And if it doesn't suck, it's going to stop you dead anyways. Let's read about that, because that's so uplifting. It makes everybody just feel wonderful about their life. <laughs> Tolkien was like, no. So, Final Volumes published in 55. And then later, four or five years after Tolkien dies, his son, Christopher, who's his literary executor, and he milked that job of literary executor totally dry. All right, I mean, from about 19, well, 1977 until Christopher Tolkien died in 2018, something like that. So, long time. He published every single scrap about Middle Earth that his father ever jotted down. 12 volume history of Middle Earth. Awful lot of people bought it. I didn't have to, actually, because I wrote the publisher and said, I teach a course on, and they sent them to me for free. <laughs> I might have lied a little bit. <laughs> so, in 1977, The Silmarillion gets published. The Silmarillion is all the backstory. It's all the stuff that Tolkien began writing in about 1915. Forward. Because even after he finished The Lord of the Rings, he didn't say, there. I'm done with Middle Earth. Nope. He kept writing. He kept fleshing out characters, stories, jotting down histories, creating new words, new derivations of words. The guy was a total linguistic nut. Okay? 
and it gets published, and it's, you know, like the New York Times bestseller list. In 1970, Tolkien's been dead four or five years. It shows the power of the Tolkien audience, so to speak. Same thing applies to J.K. Rowling. You know, the first Harry Potter book was not a New York Times bestseller. Neither was the second. Neither was the third. Book four, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, was a New York Times bestseller before you could even get your hands on it. It's the first time in history that it ever happened. And then five, six, and seven, after book five, I think, the New York Times actually changed how they do the bestseller list because they were tired of J.K. Rowling being, at that point, one, two, three, four. Because <laughs> okay? that's what they were when the fourth book came out. One, two, three, four. Number, the book four was number one. All right? So in the book five came out, they changed it to the New York Times something like adult bestseller list. Well, Harry Potter's children's literature. We can't include it. So when they created the children's literature bestseller list, by the time book seven came out, if I remember correctly, it had the first seven entries. Okay. Because she sold, it's like over 500 million copies of the books. Token over 250 by about 2000 or so. So the Silver Age comes out, and people are like, finally! Some of whom have been waiting for you know, 23 years to find out about the fall of Gondor. Find out about some of these people that are mentioned. Find out more about the Balrogs. More about Gandalf's history, because we don't get it in the Lord of the Rings, unless you are an uber nerd and you go back and read all of the appendices. Because Tolkien did give us some of that background in the appendices. Okay. Um, okay. That's enough background. Kind of um, I'm going to I'm going to come back to this, Beowulf, Monsters, and the Critics, in this. And I ought to throw in this. Wait, is that right? Assuming I have a connection. I did not think about this with my other class. I referred to it, but I didn't. Ah, not true. Those are G's. Tolkien published, he published a lot of stuff, you know, poems in Adventures of Tom Bombadil and Smith of Wooten Major and things like that. He wrote a short story, Leaf by Nibble, that is meant to accompany on fairy stories. It was first published in 1945 in the Dublin Review, and it's a short, short, I mean, it's, I don't know, 30 or 40 pages at most. The reason it's important is it is a Literary demonstration of what he's talking about in this. So it covers all the bases that are discussed in this. All right. There's actually there's actually a film. What dreams may come. Anybody seen that? Robin Williams, Cuba Gooding Jr., and I can't remember the female lead. Um. Check it out. What dreams may come. Because I am 100% positive that whoever wrote that read Leaf by Nickel. There's, there, are, there are elements that have to be from that short story. Right? 
Okay? And I needed to refer to that because I'm going to talk about it for a moment in here. So, the fairy story essay. Why I'm discussing it, why I'm literally we're not going to get to the Fellowship of the Ring, except for maybe the last two minutes if I'm like my first class, is because, again, if you want to understand Tolkien, this is how to understand Tolkien. This is, you know, the key to Tolkien. Um, back when the Harry Potter novels first came out, after I think it was second or third one, there's this guy who came out with a book called something like um, The Hidden Key to Harry Potter. You know? And he and I emailed back and forth a little bit. You know, there's some similar interests. We're both Orthodox, you know, like Eastern or Russian or Greek Orthodox. We're both Orthodox. We're both, you know, in the church and blah, blah, blah. blah. Well, he wrote this book, and he understood the way he read, you know, the Harry Potter novels was like, oh, there's this hidden code, and if you can find the hidden code, everything you know, like tumblers in the water, all fall into place, and you'll be able to decipher it. Wrong, 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 wrong. That's not how real liter or good literature works. Okay, that might be how Dan Brown literature works, you know, find the hidden map. And... Tolkien doesn't give us a code. What he gives us is an approach that happens to work with nearly everything he ever wrote. So, he delivers this, this lecture. And he says at the beginning of it, and again, you've got a link to the PDF of the lecture on under the content tab. Um, I strongly, highly encourage you to read it. And he addresses this audience of undergraduates primarily, but also some faculty. Okay. And he says, you know, I'm not a scholar of, fantasy, of fairy stories. And he wasn't. He's a scholar of Old and Middle English and a whole bunch of other languages. But he says, I, I haven't studied them in the scholarly sense. He says, but I enjoy them, and I read them, and I told them to my children. And that's kind of what qualifies me to give you this lecture. Plus, I wrote a modern fairy story. He doesn't say that part. That I wrote a modern fairy story. But he says, you know, I've enjoyed them. So, yes? Why do you say he doesn't like them if he wrote them? He doesn't say that he doesn't like them. He says he didn't study them. He wasn't a scholar of fairy stories. Like, there, there are, you know, mythologers. People who study myth and write scholarly papers and books and such about myth, maybe about the origins, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He's saying, I never did that. Having looked at his manuscripts, he's lying a little bit. I mean, he does go into great detail, but he's never published anything about it. You know, sort of supposedly, in order to be a scholar about something, you have to pu publish in it, on it. Okay. So, according to that definition, I'm not a Tolkien scholar. I've never, no, I've never published anything on Tolkien. I edited a journal that was largely devoted to Tolkien. So I took all these other people's stuff, you know, cleaned them up, etc. So he says, but you've asked me to deliver it, so I got to say something. So there are three questions I think we should talk about. One, what are fairy stories? That is, what's the definition of fairy stories? Two, what are their origins? How did they come to be? And three, he says, what are their purpose? Now, take the male part off. <laughs> he says, what are their purpose? Why did fairy stories come to be? So he starts with that first question. Imagine a word would require you to write a paper. And imagine I asked you to examine what are fairy stories. How might you begin that? Or you're asking another class to write about something for a literature course. I would bet almost all of you, if you had to write a paper in a previous class and it was about something you had no idea what the topic or word meant, how do you begin? 
Research. How do you begin the research? Okay, keep going. What's one going to be one of the first things that Google's going to return? A dictionary definition. You turn to the dictionary. You see a word, you don't know what it is. Hopefully, you look it up. Okay? Tolkien worked on the Oxford English Dictionary. So he says, let's see what the OED says. And the OED gives a definition, and he's kind of like, well, then that sucks, because that's not a good definition. Because it says something like, a story of or pertaining to fairies. Really? <laughs> How useful is that for a definition? <laughs> Almost every definition for something, it will begin that way. A blank of or pertaining to... Okay, so what is the... Mm, what's a fairy? Is a fairy a little tiny person like Tinkerbell or whatever? Not necessarily. Okay, so... In raising this question, Tolkien is raising the question of definition. And to make a long story short, he ultimately says, in response to this question, you cannot define them. Think of what the word define literally means. The fine in define is like the fine or related to the fine in infinite. How is the word infinite dissimilar to defined. What does one mean that the other does not? If something is infinite, it's what? Ongoing. Ongoing. Keep going. <laughs> Notice the pun there. Go on. It doesn't have one necessary meaning. Does it have one necessary meaning? Like an unnumbered it's un what? Endless. You ever okay. undefined. <laughs> it's limitless. There are no boundaries to it. If it's infinite, there's no ending. Is the universe infinite? Yeah, you know. <laughs> According to Edwin Hubble, the philosopher. Mm -hmm. The astronomer after whom the Hubble telescope is named? In one sense, you have to say no, the universe is not infinite. Why? What supposedly did the Hubble telescope show us? And what supposedly, not supposedly, what did Hubble or his theories about the universe say about the universe? And the more important part, it had a beginning called now the Big Bang. And what did it do after it banged? And it's still expanding. The Hubble constant refers to the rate at which the universe expands. It's called a constant because it doesn't change. Guess what? The new telescope that's been put in space, the James Webb Space Telescope, it's got astrophysicists wetting themselves <laughs> because it's suggesting the images that are coming back are suggesting everything that is now thought about the Big Bang is wrong. Because the farther, 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 farther back we see should be earlier, 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 earlier in time to the Big Bang. And it was always thought that those galaxies that came into being relatively soon after the Big Bang would take one shape or form, and what the James Webb Telescope is showing us is it's exactly the opposite. I read a thing the other day, and you know, this one astronomer said, you know, panic is probably not too strong a word. Everything I have taught and thought for the last 30 years is wrong. Wrong. So if there's no Big Bang, how, okay, that's how important that is, right? Origins. So that's infinity, no end, no limit. So to define something, to take infinity and 
as Hamlet puts it, I could be a king of infinite space in a nutshell were it not for bad dreams. That is, if I were like in a walnut shell, I would think of that space inside that shell as infinite if I didn't have bad dreams. What the hell is he talking about? Mm -hmm. Where do dreams come from? Title of that movie, What Dreams May Come? Do they come from inside? Or do they come from outside? Think of this room as that walnut. This room is infinite space. And then we have, you know, this stupid thing. <laughs> if this room is infinite space, this is all there is. And then somebody comes in. What does that tell us? It's not all that there is. Because if somebody can come in, then there's something else out there. If the universe is constantly expanding and the universe is infinite, what's it expanding into? <laughs> that is what's outside the universe. Over my paper. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, Tolkien says, we can't answer what fairy stories are in the terms of we cannot define them. But he does say, I know one when I see one. That's what we can say. It's like the Supreme Court Justice, it's either Byron Wright or Potter Stewart. I could bring my son in, just got his law degree, and he would say, Dad, I've told you this half a dozen times, and I always forget. An issue of obscenity or pornography came before the Supreme Court. And one of the, Potter Stewart or Byron Wright said, I can't define pornography, but I know it when I see it. <laughs> That is, I can't say, well, pornography has to have, but that's pornography. <laughs> and this isn't, you know, kind of a thing. So, we can't define them. So, next question. And he literally, in this, you know, essay that's about 90 pages, including the end notes and stuff, he literally spends like 20 pages to eventually say, can't answer that question. Next question. <laughs> what are their origins? How did they come to be? Who wrote Cinderella? Who wrote Snow White? Who wrote King Arthur? It wasn't Thomas Mallory. Thomas Mallory wrote a version of King Arthur. Disney did not write, thank God, Cinderella <laughs> and Snow White. Look at the Disney version and go back and read the version in the Grimm's Brothers. Because what do the women... And Cinderella do so they can marry Prince Charming. <laughs> they cut their toes off. They trim their heels so they can get in that damn glass slipper. Because he's the problem. He's the solution to all their problems in life. You don't, you don't get that in the Disney version. You know, read the real uh, Hansel and Gretel. I mean, the witch, yeah, she gets deep fried, you know. Oven fried, actually, or cooked. Where do these stories come from? We alluded to this a little bit the other day. How did Thor arise? Don't answer, Marvel. You know, <laughs> it's not Chris Hemsworth. It was an like answer to an unknown question, or an answer to something that we're going. Hmm. How, how do you explain that? How do you explain that thing that happens during storms? We know now, scientifically, what causes it. How do you explain a rainbow? We know now a rainbow is merely caused by the refraction of light in water droplets in the sky. It's cold, man. That is a deadly, boring description. How does the book of Genesis give us the origin of a rainbow? <clears throat> And God put his bow in the sky as a promise, as a sign, not the promise itself, as a sign that he will never destroy the world by flood again. So whenever there's rain, if, especially if you see sunshine, and you go out and you look for the thing. And if there's a double rainbow, ooh, ah. If there's a triple, <laughs> you know, even more, ooh, and ah. Okay? It's an explanation for something that when you first look at it, you're kind of like, how can that be? 
It's not explicable in your daily, you know, existence. Think of something as simple as if you were up this morning at, I don't know, 6 o'clock, maybe a little bit earlier, a little bit later, um, what would you see in the east? My wife and I spent a week in Charleston a couple weeks ago. And, you know, we wanted to be sure to, to get to the beach, Isle of Palms, um, to see the sunrise. Growing up in California, never saw the sunrise over the ocean. Saw a few sunsets, you know, because it goes over to Japan and stuff. Never saw. So last year, first time, you know, I got to see the sunrise. And it's, it's amazing if the sky is nice. So the first time we went, cloudy is all, you know, it's just horrible. You know, second day wasn't bad, but we got there a few minutes late. Third day, we got there like 10 minutes before sunrise. There were breaks in the clouds, and oh, it was just gorgeous. Okay. But how do you explain what terminology do we use to describe visually seeing the sun when it trying to think of how to phrase this without giving away what I want. When you see it over the ocean, what do we say? It, the sun does what? Rises in the east and sets in the west. Scientifically correct? Not at all. 100% wrong. The sun does not rise at all. The sun spins, and then it has its own orbit. What is the sun's orbit around? The center of the Milky Way galaxy. Where are we in the Milky Way galaxy? We're on one of the outer arms. So why do we say the sun rises and sets? That's our perception. It's wrong. I mean, you can stand there all day. You can watch it. It's rising and it's setting. It's the earth that's moving. But we don't perceive the earth is moving. So rising and setting, actually, they're a metaphor. We don't think of it as a metaphor, but they are. Water, so, so how did that happen? Well, the ancient Greeks and probably the Babylonians and the Akkadians and the Sumerians before them said, ah. Oh, the goddess Aurora rises. Or the god Helios has saddled up his horses and he's riding the sun across the sky. So we get these myths that help explain things that we can't otherwise explain. I mean, every now and then you'll still hear people refer to the man in the moon. Why? Because you go out on a good full moon, or it's really big, you know, a giant, super giant moon, and you can kind of see the face. But when Neil Armstrong stepped out, he goes, damn, he's really here. No, he said, one giant leap, no. So how do we get these origins of stories? Well, Tolkien uses this metaphor, okay, of soup or stew. Get a big old pot, put some fire underneath it, put some water in it. And what do you do to make a stew or a soup? What do you add to that pot other than the water that I just mentioned? Yeah. Stuff. Old tires, old shoes, dirty underwear. Yeah. Mm, please no. <laughs> Corn, maybe. If I don't know, corn sounds, and stew sounds horrible to me. Carrots, celery, cabbage maybe, you know, some meat, potatoes, not sugar, man, my brains. Salt, pepper, and other spices and herbs. And then you let it cook, right? Depending if you want it runny, you may not cook it as much. If you want it all mushy and everything, let it cook for, oh, I don't know, like 24, 48 hours. Everything breaks down and just becomes slop, okay? Tolkien says that's how fairy stories ultimately arise. Elements get added into what he calls the cauldron of story. So, for example, 
in the Harry Potter novels and the Lord of the Rings, we're going to see something in each of those novels that gives somebody a particular ability. And it's the same ability. It's one of the things that links the two. I'm seeing a couple of heads do this. What is that ability? Invisibility. There is a ring that confers invisibility in the Lord of the Rings. Tolkien, by the way, does not create that. That's an idea from Norse literature. The dwarves in Norse literature make rings that make you invisible. J.K. Rowling has the cloak of invisibility. You wear it, it makes you invisible. Okay? Why? Why? Why do you want to be invisible? Okay, maybe you're a thief inside, and it'd be pretty nice to be invisible, because you can sneak into people's homes and steal stuff from them. That's one reason. Maybe you're tired of people looking into your business, and so you just kind of want to disappear for a while. Doesn't matter why. What Tolkien suggests is this desire for invisibility is something that obviously, it's in ancient literature. It obviously goes back thousands of years. And so it gets, it's one of those elements that gets dropped into the cauldron of story. And it pops out in various kinds of stories. Okay. Um, you could, I mean, there's even elements of that a little bit, like in Star Wars. I mean, when Obi-Wan goes, these are not the droids you're looking for. <laughs> that essentially makes those droids invisible to those stormtroopers. Okay. What other kinds of things can get dropped in there? Or people. The title of the third volume is The Return of the King. That implies what about the king? Left, disappeared, he's missing. Can you think of another missing slash absent slash disappeared slash left king in literature or fairy stories? I don't have it written down anywhere. No, I don't. King Arthur. See, according to some people today, and I mean literally, there are Brits who believe this. King Arthur, one, is real. <laughs> and two, he's still alive. He's asleep. And when Britain slash England has its greatest need, Arthur will return. He is merely sleeping in Avalon. No. Mordred killed him. He mostly killed him. Why? Because Miracle Max gave him the pill and he woke up. Little Princess Bride illusion there. Um, he's not dead. He'll come back. Who might King Arthur be modeled on? Is there another missing king? This time kind of in the real world. In a religious tradition. For Christians, Jesus. Right? Jesus came. Jesus died. Jesus resurrected. Jesus ascended. He said, I'm coming back. Probably without the Arnold accent, you know. I'm coming back, you know. And he'll return at some point. Okay? Most of the apostles, based upon what you read in the New Testament, they thought he was coming soon. I mean, John even ends Revelation. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Define quickly. That's a relative term. What about Jews? And... and Orthodox, serious, religious Jew is still looking for, expecting the Messiah. Why? Jesus wasn't the Messiah. He died. The Messiah is not going to die. That was one of the big hang-ups Jews had with Jesus. Because he died. But when the Messiah comes, what's the Messiah going to do and be like? Rebuild the temple. What else? He'll be like David. His father, David, was a king, man. He conquered his enemies. I mean, Goliath, he was just the first. 
and the Messiah will do that. All right? By the way, just a little, you know, throw this out there to be tantalizing. There is a Messiah in the Harry Potter novels. Talk about that one. So there's an there's that image, a missing king. Okay? So all this stuff gets added in. Big freaking deal, Tolkien essentially says. Okay? Tuesday, don't bother having breakfast. I'll prepare it for you. So just don't. And it's not like I'm going to bring in, you know, donut country donuts or something like that. It's going to be eggs, bacon, sausage, toast, milk, coffee, orange juice, the whole nine yards. So don't even worry about it. So you come in Tuesday at 940, and you're hungry, and you're expecting food. And you come in, and I've got a table set up here, and I've got three dozen eggs in the curtains. <laughs> and I've got a couple loaves of bread, and I've got some butter, and I've got some milk, and I've got a bunch of oranges, and I've got a bag of coffee, and I've got water, and I've got something to heap of water in, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Dig in! <laughs> what are you going to do? I'm hungry. I can't eat that. <laughs> okay, maybe your body will eat you know, good raw eggs. Have at it. <laughs> what is that? Those are the ingredients for breakfast. Those are the things that get dropped into the cauldron of story, out of which stories come. Tolkien says, trying to figure out their origins, you're doing the same thing. You're taking the story apart. And then what do you end up with? Parts of a story. You end up with parts of a breakfast. What do you have to do? You got to take it all, mix it all up, cook it, fry it, with whatever. Then you can eat it. If all you have are the elements of the story, you don't have the story. But the Hobbit has a bunch of dwarves. Feely and Keely and Ori and Ori and Dory and Orin and, and Bifur and Bofur and Bomber and blah, blah, blah. Balin and Dwalin and... Twelve, thirteen of them. Twelve of them. Twelve or thirteen of them. All those names come from Old Norse literature. So a lot of people, early on when the Lord of the Rings was published, they're like, oh, what are Tolkien's sources? And they start looking at Old Norse, and there's stuff there. They start looking at Old English, there's stuff there. They start looking at the Finnish epic, the Finnish nationalistic epic, the Kalevala, there's elements there. They start looking at Celtic slash Welsh literature. There's stuff there, but they're all carrots and tomatoes and celery thrown in the pot. Okay, We're going to hear Gandalf say, or Gandalf, depending on your pronunciation, he who would destroy a thing to find out what it is has left the path of wisdom. This is one reason I don't have you write papers in here. Because what every other English professor will do in that paper, they expect you to analyze something. What does that word analyze literally mean? You break it down. Oh, I like the first word. You dissect it. Okay. My daughter's a pre-vet major. She worked over the summer in internship at a lab in, in Nashville. Uh, a... I don't even remember the term. A necropsy lab? It's not necropsy, it's necro something, where they get all these dead animals and they take them apart to figure out why are they dead. Well, they took them apart for <laughs> <laughs> They were dead when they arrived. Okay? Well, I mean, she's scooping out brains of alpacas and goats and, you know, all kinds of stuff. Okay? You're not going to figure out what the Lord of the Rings means by taking it apart. And this is what takes me back to this. This essay, Beowulf the Monsters and the Critics, Tolkien is saying that what all the critics up until him did. And it's because that's what all the critics up until him did. They looked at the old English epic poem Beowulf to use it as a source to give or to find information about ancient Germanic culture and customs and practices. 
how they did gift giving, why they did gift giving, what, you know, what kinds of swords and such are used, how are they named, what are they named, blah, 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 blah. Rather than, who is Beowulf, and why is he fighting these three monsters? All the critics before Tolkien said these, Grindel, Grindel's mother, and the dragon are totally extraneous to the real story. They said they're unimportant. And Tolkien was like, how blind can you be? They're central. Why? Because the story is about the rise and fall of a great hero. What must every great hero have? A companion and a great story. And or how do you become a hero? A villain. A thank you. A villain. You, you gotta have somebody that you're fighting. Or a thing that you're fighting. You know, we talk about, well, I won't say we, I. I talk about those firefighters and cops who ran to the Twin Towers on 9-11. It's heroes. What's the villain? It's not the guys flying the planes. They're already dead. I mean, you can say they're villains. Time. Time. How much time do they have? Until that top floor starts. Some of them survived. Some of them got in, got people out, and survived. An awful lot of them didn't. That's heroic. They put themselves on the line for that. Soldiers, you know, we're going to see a passage where a character in the Lord of the Rings is talking, talks about, it's not just men, it's, there's an adjective, I can't remember what it is. Men who stand sentinel, we would say today men and women, who stand sentinel while others sleep comfortably in their beds. In fact, the passage is going to be, yeah, the people of the Shire are fat, dumb, and happy. My words, my paraphrase. Fat, dumb, and happy, and simple. And fat, dumb, happy, and simple, they should stay. They shouldn't know about the bad things happening out in the world. Let's just keep them in this nice little cocoon. That goes totally against, I would say, everything our society says. Our society says, no, knowledge is power. Knowledge gives you strength. Really? Think about it. How much does it really help to know every little thing that goes on in Ukraine? What does it tend to do more of? And, place it, and I, I am the chief of sinners here, man. I check Drudge, not as much as I used to, because whoever runs Drudge has completely went out. But I used to check it, you know, like hourly to see what kinds of updates there are. Why? Because I'm a news junkie. I mean, it's like shooting up. That's why I said first day of class, you can reach me by email. 12, 16 hours a day. I'm connected. It's like, pull the matrix out. You know? okay. So, the origins don't matter. So Tolkien spends like another 30, 40 pages going into mythology and the origins of language, all of which is to say it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what their origins are. Just because you know something's origins doesn't tell you what it is now. And with this, he creates an image. He says, it's like somebody who found this big tower. Big old tower. And they wanted to figure out how it was made. So they took it all apart. And then they couldn't put it back together again. And so they don't know what it is. All right? So don't worry about what it is. So again, that's why I don't have you write. I don't want you analyzing. I want this stuff to just kind of enter into you, uh, you know, like a virus, but to come <laughs> through your eyes and enter your brain and just sit there and perk like the cauldron of story. Because there will be a point, and literally I've had this happen, I don't know how many times over the last 30 years that I've been teaching. I've had students come up to me years later, I see them in Walmart or somewhere, and they're going, 
you know, we read something in that class. It might not be this one. It might be my fantasy lit verse. We read something in there, and I was doing such and such, or reading such and such, and I remembered, and it clicked, and I was like, good. That's the point of education, to make those kinds of connections, okay? So, he gets to this one. And Tolkien now rephrases the question. See, he doesn't do that with the other two. He doesn't ever say, what are fairy stories? Well, let me refine my question to where I can answer. No, nope. he just says, don't know. What are the origins? Doesn't matter. Where he had said, what are their purposes? He now says, what are their uses? What are their use and function now? The purpose implies what at the outset? A couple minutes ago, I said something that kind of gave this away a little bit in talking about why I don't want you to analyze the story. What do we often do when we read a work of literature? Now, a work of literature doesn't have to mean, you know, this or Shakespeare or some, you know, dreadfully boring thing that you had to read in high school or whatever. It can mean a song lyric, which is nothing but poetry. Some of it's good, a lot of it's bad, okay? Why does every author write? It's not, this one, this is not deep. This is real surface level. To get a message across. Every author writes because there is something inside that wants to be out. That's it. It might be some deep moral message. You should be a better person, you know. Read my book. I'll make you a better person. How to be a better person. Go to any bookstore and go to the how-to or the self-help, you know, possibly. What else could they, There's a meaning. There's something there. Now, Tolkien is going to tell us in the preface to the second edition that to my intentions in writing this, there is no inner meaning or message. He literally states that. Everything is important. Everything hinges on that one word, in my intention. Can you say something and mean something else? <laughs> yes. We all do that daily. How does sarcasm work? <laughs> sarcasm. Sore hole. Or sore Abyss. That's what it literally means. Think of what that implies. And I say that as, you know, again, chief of center. My family's extremely sarcastic. We say my, you know, one of my daughters, she has no soul. There's just an inner darkness. It's, <laughs> it's, it's like Simon and Garfunkel met her and said, hello, darkness, my old friend. <laughs> okay? When you use sarcasm, what are you doing? You're opening a hole of pain. <laughs> okay? You say one thing, something else is meant. Tolkien says, I did not set out to create this big, big, big long story with an inner message. Does that mean it does not have an inner message? No. Because he also states, Authors can't tell you everything that's in their works. Right? When C.S. Lewis, I don't remember if it was this class or one of my other, it was one of my other classes, one of my students said, I mentioned C.S. Lewis, he said, oh, I just read Chronicles of Narnia for the first time, and it's like my whole world's been opened up. What should I read next? And so I you know, told him. When C.S. Lewis first wrote, or wrote the first Chronicle of Narnia, Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe, he did not initially set out to write what has been called a Christian allegory. He set out to write a story because these images plagued him for over 10 years. That is, they just kept coming up in his mind. A fawn, half human, half goat, in the snow, carrying packages and an umbrella. And he's like, 
Am I going crazy? What? Where does this come from? And a big, giant, golden, tawny lion. He's like, I don't know what this means. And after a while, he starts putting pen to paper, and he comes up with the Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, which Tolkien hated. <laughs> Why? Oh, this. How many of you have read Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe? Anybody? A few of you. You know, you're timid. Yeah, of course. How many of you have seen the film? Maybe a few more of you, okay? <laughs> what is, who do the Pevensey, Pevensey, how are you pronounce your names, kids meet fairly early on, like within the first fourth of the Chronicles of Narnia, when they're trying to escape the White Witch. It's morning. They've been hiding. More specifically, Father Christmas. This is Narnia. It is not our world. What do you have to have before you can get Father Christmas? Christmas, which means Christ Mass. Christ. Incarnation. God becomes man as a little baby. He lives, dies, blah, blah, blah. You got to have that. Narnia doesn't have Jesus. Narnia is not saved, you know, so to speak. <laughs> There's no Jesus in Narnia. So what the hell is Father Christmas doing in Narnia? Tolkien asked Jack. Jack was the nickname for C.S. Lewis. He's like, it doesn't work. It doesn't fit. Narnia is in other place. How'd Jesus get there? <laughs> <laughs> Problem is, that's all Lewis had written at that point. We come to find out in a later novel, and this is why the novel should be read, in the order in which they were written, rather than in the order in which the publisher is now packaging them. Narnia was created in book six out of the seven book series. And a whole bunch of stuff happens, and then we come to the origin story. And its origin, ultimately, is here, where there is Jesus. So you can say, yeah, Narnia is saved if you want, you know. <laughs> Tolkien didn't know that in 1950. Lewis didn't know that in 1950. My point for all that is when Lewis wrote Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, he didn't know that he was going to write a story that involved somebody who would be a Jesus figure. He knew that, however, as he started writing the story. He didn't set out with that. Okay. So what is their use and function now? Okay, we're talking about for adults, not children. Go back for a minute. He says they're for adults. Why aren't they for children? If you were to tell somebody, you know, I'm taking this class in fairy stories. Or let me rephrase that. Because most people probably go, oh, cool. <laughs> but if you tell somebody, an adult, let me put it this way. Then you're taking a course, a college-level course, and you're getting credit in The Lord of the Rings and the Harry Potter novels. I can guarantee you probably 50% 50 the, 50 of the people who you say that to would go, what? You're getting credit for that? Really? Why? Why would they say that? I've had people tell me, Wait, you, you teach that? You get paid? <laughs> And you only teach like nine months of the year, and you only work like two hours a day, and you know, all that kind of, I mean, you professor, yeah. <laughs> and I actually teach two of them, and the second one's just a repeat of the first one, you know, for the one. <laughs> Why? What's, what is thought about that kind of literature? And believe me, it's not just people out there, it's people in my own apartment who would say some of this. It's for children, which means... It's childish. I mean, so after what's childish, what comes next? Grow up. <laughs> I mean, you're 60 freaking years old. Read stuff that's meant for 60-year-olds. Like, like what? <laughs> Stephen King, Catcher in the Rye. Am I only supposed to walk around like Holden Caulfield? Put a gun in your head. <laughs> Tolkien addresses that problem. Okay. So he says... So, so why do we associate children with fairy stories? 
marketing <laughs> is one modern reason, 20th century. Is it? Were the Greek myths originally for children? No. What about something like Snow White or Cinderella? Okay, I'm going to be very sick. Ladies, is Cinderella myth really to teach you how to catch your Prince Charming? <laughs> Chop off your feet if you need to <laughs> to get that man, you know? Whoa. If I put this on YouTube, I'm no, right, actually, I've got comments turned off now because I had to go through 10 years worth of comments and just delete them all. <laughs> How can you say that? Dude? No. So why did Tolkien says that it's in the 19th century that fairy stories get linked to children? Why? Because essentially adults were too busy for them. What happened in the 19th century? Let's say intellectually in the Western world. What, what makes the 19th century different from, say, the 12th century? Industrial revolution. Industrial revolution. Science. science, progress of science, 1859. What happens? No, that's in the, that's in the 20th century. A biologist, actually he's a naturalist, takes a little trip on a boat. Charles Darwin publishes on the origin of species, which completely, in one sense, turns the world upside down. But Darwin didn't intend that. Darwin didn't say, God is a fiction. And we're all just like, <laughs> he didn't say that at all. <laughs> download, download the image or you drink, okay? no but we had this move and there's a wonderful poem called Dover Beach written by Matthew Arnold okay, that talks about the shift in kind of a religious way of looking at life and, and all I mean by that is that there's a spiritual significance to life there's more than what we can just see two all we can see is what's important. Okay. Tolkien says, because people were too busy, essentially, they did what with fairy stories? Just as they did with things in their home. And people still, people, me, my wife, still do this. If you've got a large family, we've got four kids. I grew up with a family with five kids. But we had a small house. I mean, my garage is almost bigger than the house I grew up in. Um, what often, what do parents often do with the furniture that, let's say, is no longer appropriate for the living room where you might have friends and guests come that you want to entertain? What do you do with it? You can do a couple things, right? Now, you can put on Facebook, Marketplace, believe me, anything <laughs> will sell or be taken for free. Okay? Two, you can put on Craigslist. Or three, if your house is of sufficient size, you might put it in the bonus room where the kids play. All my kids were growing up, but when they weren't, you know, they would play on stuff. And believe me, it would get destroyed you know, very, very quickly, even if it was already destroyed. Okay? So we've got literally up in our bonus room, the room over our garage, we've got a couch that's, uh, this is 1922, this 2022, <laughs> this thing's got to be at least 40 years old. Because it was my father-in-law's, father and he died in 1997. And he had it for a long time. Okay? So Tolkien says, it gets relegated to the nursery just like old furniture does, that the parents no longer want. But it's still in good enough condition that, to keep. So the fairy stories get relegated there. Because what, you may not know this, what happens beginning... Mid nineteenth century, uh, mid eighteenth century, we have a development of a new kind of literature: the novel. The novel, primarily before then, poetry and plays. At first, they're published in magazines, serial publication, but then they get just published as novels. Well, novels, serious adult fiction, 
And there are lots of novelists from the 19th century that nobody reads. Why? Because it's garbage. <laughs> Unless you're working on a PhD in the 19th century and you've got to come up with a dissertation topic. Find something nobody's ever written about and write about that. Little clue. Why has nobody ever written about it? Yeah, because it's not worth writing about, right? So Tolkien says it gets shoved off to the children. Why? Won't hurt them, and they can't do anything, and it's not important. Why else does he suggest, or why does he say, suggest children don't need it? I mentioned this briefly the other day. Why do we need fairy stories, but a five-year-old doesn't? Or a ten-year-old does it. What? To escape what? Reality. Yeah, this world. And they have imaginations already. Imaginary friends. Pretend. If you start walking around Peck Hall, talking, and there's nobody next to you, <laughs> believe me, things are going to happen. <laughs> many, many, many years ago. I was coming back from KUC. This is when you know I got my mail over there, and I used to check it all the time. I was coming back from KUC. It was between class break, and so I'm walking back, and there's a guy walking. I don't know, 20, 30 feet ahead of me, and I'm not kidding with my description or anything. This guy's wearing a tutu, like a ballerina tutu, not a male ballerina's, you know, leotard or whatever, but the little frilly thing, and he's got. Uh, Paper clips hanging from his earlobes, nose, eyebrows, lips, chin, lots of tats, and he's skipping. <laughs> Literally, I can't even skip him. Skipping down that big walkway. And there's a mass, like a herd, of students coming from Peck Hall, heading towards KUC. And I, it's like Moses at the Red Sea, man. This is I watch, and it, poof. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't get a hankered saying, everybody, you know, it's just, okay. Because of the oddity, the difference of it. So, he was in his own world. <laughs> and I don't mean that negatively. I mean, this guy, I think, could be wrong. He was full of wonder. And he was wonderful in that sense. He might have been full of something else simultaneously. <laughs> he might have been stoned out of his gourd as far as I know. Right? What's the point? He didn't give a ratchet a word where everybody else thought. A five-year-old will walk and pick the oh. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> That's amazing. You know? And I'd go, put it down. It's that sense of wonder. We don't have that. Why? Because we've grown up partially. What is part of growing up? Tolkien specifically, he actually addresses this. It's losing that sense of wonder. But it's also, he says, happens too much, becoming wickeder. He says, children are meant to grow up, but not to become more wicked. Right? Growing up doesn't mean you have to become bad. Growing up doesn't mean you have to become jaded. Right? So, yeah, I can't believe I didn't get this on. So, he says, fairy stories are meant for us, for adults. And they offer us these four things. Fantasy, recovery, escape, and consolation. Fantasy, arresting strangers. What would you do right now? Let's assume this is open all the way. Which way. If I pointed out that window and you saw, as I pointed out that window, suddenly a massive UFO just come down, squish all the oak trees, and just sit there with maybe some lights and you can, you know, hear the do 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 do, you know, music. <laughs> I don't know about you. But I'd be saying, excuse me, because I'd be wetting my pants. You know, but I'm heading out the door. <laughs> that would freeze us, probably, in our place. 
that would be arresting strangeness. He says fantasy gives us that, or fairy stories give us that. Recovery, seeing as we are meant to see. What does that mean? Seeing as we were meant to see. It means seeing everything and everybody as totally distinct and other, and seeing them as if you've never seen them before. Get on YouTube. I actually went into this more detail in my previous class. I'm going to, I'm going to shoot you the link to that class. And if you want, you can watch like the last 20 minutes of it. Because we're not going to get all that from here. Get on YouTube and do a little search for um, person seeing for the first time or person hearing for the first time. You could be the hardest hearted, coldest, meanest SOB. And some of those will have you in tears. I mean, there's one, and it's of a couple. They've been married, I don't know when, for like eight, ten years. And I think she's deaf. There's another one, I think she's blind. I mean, they're both women. Has surgery, bandages come off, and she sees her husband for the first time. Not like you see me right now clear, you know, all that kind of, but just an image and just tears. There's another one of a little kid hearing his parents' voices. And again, there's one of an old guy. It's like a grandpa. It's in the 60s or 70s. And he sees his wife and children. And you nearly just put them on the floor. That's what Tolkien means. Fairy stories enable us to take these things that we look through day in and day out and take them off. It enables us to look, you know, I've been married 37 years, to see my wife like when I first saw her. Literally, when I first saw her, I said, I'm going to marry her. Took a lot of beating down. Finally got her, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you that story. <laughs> Escape. You use the word escape from what? This world. How many of you wake up every morning and you're just like, can't wait to go out. It's going to be a great day. You've taken your Dale Carnegie positive outlook on life course. Uh uh. No, it's usually. No. <laughs> Not again. Or, you know, you get around. I can't believe I got Sherman again. And there's 15 more weeks of this. Okay? You want to escape from reality. What's the biggest part of reality we want, we want to escape from? What's the thing people fear the most? Thank you. Death. Why? As Hamlet puts it, it's the undiscovered country from whose born no one returns. See, death is like this door without what? How many of you have gone... Oh, death doesn't look so bad. I, I can see beyond the corner just a little bit. It's not like that. And you don't get to go, hey, can I sample death? <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way. Okay, we'll stop there. Um, I will talk a little bit about consolation. Just read, man. Just read, read, read. Okay. What is the purpose Don't know yet. Probably sometime next week. I'm assuming we're going to finish Fellowship of the Ring next week. Big assumption. All that means is if we don't, Harry Potter gets condensed. Which book five, I can condense a lot of. Yeah, you can just tell your